Welcome uh, to the commencement celebration for the UCLA Department of Physics and Astronomy. I'm uh, James Rosenzweig. I'm a uh, professor in this department, and I'm the uh, chairman of the department. So it falls upon me to uh, uh, direct traffic here and be the uh, MC for this uh, this uh, ceremony. Uh, it's actually one of my favorite uh, things to do. One of the favorite duties I have during the year because. Uh, all of uh, the friends and family who are the sort of backbone of our brilliant young uh, graduates come and actually uh, show their faces and show their uh, support. Uh, we very much appreciate uh, uh, that you did this. Uh, so we're impressed uh, that you come down and, uh, and celebrate with us. We're uh, also really quite impressed with the achievement of your uh, your children and your friends. Um, you should be impressed too. Uh, the degree in uh, physics uh, or in biophysics or in astrophysics that's granted by UCLA through this department is not a trivial matter. Um, it's probably every, every bit as challenging as you imagine and uh, in ways that you probably cannot quite imagine. So you can, you can talk to your, your graduates about that. Um, our agenda includes uh, the most important recognition, which is, of course, uh, the graduation for both the bachelor's and uh, uh, the uh, PhD programs. We also are going to be recognizing um, uh, those who have achieved uh, special levels of uh, uh, of performance during their graduate or uh, undergraduate careers here. Um, you'll hear from uh, two, of the, two of our students uh, who will give their remarks, which are always a bit more lively than uh, the faculty's, so you should look forward to that. And, uh, uh, but you'll also hear from a graduate from some years back who is our commencement uh, speaker uh, today. Howard Preston, and uh, uh, in the tradition of our graduating students, uh, he has a very engaging uh, uh, talk to give, uh, recounting uh, what it means uh, to go out from this uh, university with a physics deg degree and do things that are slightly different than physics uh, uh, with this degree. So without uh, further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce the stars of the show, which is the the students, so if we could have our graduating students uh, enter and uh, have their seats. Our students uh, have many talents, uh, some of which they did not learn through our tutelage. Uh, one such is a PhD candidate today, Matthew House, uh, who, who, is, who is rumored to have uh, vocal talents that are quite considerable. So he's going to sing for us, uh, God Bless America. Thank you, Matthew. America, land that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans, white with foam, God bless America, my home sweet home, God bless America, my home sweet home. Uh, 
Uh, to begin the departmental uh, recognitions, um, I would like to call representatives of both the uh, Rudnick and the Abelman family uh, sitting here to uh, give uh, uh, the presentation of the Rudnick Abelman uh, scholarship. Uh, and if you gentlemen, please uh, come on up. and introduce yourselves. <laughs> well, I'm the Rudnick part. <laughs> uh, those of you who were at uh, Drake Stadium yesterday will, will probably recognize me. I think my face was occasionally on the Jumbotron. I, I'm the one who told you to yell your lungs out when I, when I announced the, your major. Uh, the Rudnick Abelman Scholarships honor the memory and accomplishments of Isidore Rudnick, a distinguished, much honored, and deeply treasured member of our department from 1948 until its retirement in 1987. It also recognizes the important contributions to this department and institution of Ron Abelman, a highly successful alumnus and greatly valued friend. Ron and his wife, Gerald, who is in the audience, were honored guests at the college commencement yesterday and to our great good fortune were able to attend this ceremony as well. Ron uh, is going to be joining me in presenting the scholarships to this year's recipients, and he has a few words to tell. Thank you, Joe. And first, my congratulations to you all. I cringe to think that it was 52 years ago that I was in your shoes. Uh, and you have an absolutely marvelous background, a wonderful future ahead of you. Uh, one of my favorite professor advisors uh, when I was going through my five and a half years in the uh, physics department uh, was Joe's father, Isidore Rudnick. Uh, Izzy was somebody who encouraged me thoroughly throughout uh, my physics background here. And when I decided to go to business school, encouraged me in that direction too in those days. Uh, and I think today there still is a strong need for people of technical background in the business community, particularly in the defense industry and uh, R&D activities. So it was really a number of years back in honor of uh, Izzy, as we called him, that we decided to establish this endowment, the objective of which was to help students both at an undergraduate and graduate level who were particularly financially needing. And at this stage, uh, very, very proud and happy that over 30 students have taken advantage of the uh, funding that we've made, made available through the endowment. The endowment is not only just ours, but there are a number of participants that uh, we've engaged to, uh, to add to the endowment fund. Uh, and I would certainly encourage all of you, once you graduate and those who are watching your graduates, uh, if, uh, if you see the means to do so, uh, to also contribute to the Rudnick Abelman Scholarship. Thank you, Ron. Um, so as Ron said, this, actually the Rudnick Abelman Scholarship recognizes the achievements and the promise of undergrads and grad students who have not yet finished their studies. It's our great pleasure to acknowledge with certificate and uh, as you might guess now, a pretty substantial check. All, who have, all, the, all that they've done so far and all that we know that they will accomplish. Um, this year there are four students have been chosen as Rudnick Abelman Scholars. And I'll read their names out, and uh, those who are present can come and uh, receive the certificate. I have been told the checks are in the mail. <laughs> so first, uh, Daniel Mark Hill. Could you? And second, Alan Tran. I guess uh, Alan will be receiving it, it later. Uh, with the two grad students are Kristen Kulas. And finally, is he here? And uh, he isn't here, but Gregory Mace. Thanks, 
It is uh, my pleasure now to introduce Professor David Salzberg, who will uh, be presenting the, for the first time uh, the Winstein Award for Achievement in uh, Undergraduate Research in High Energy Physics. Thanks, Jamie. It's really a pleasure to give out awards to uh, recognize the really outstanding students we have. And of course, they're all outstanding, but a few uh, really, really, uh, really stand out and we like to give a little extra recognition. This award, the Winstein Award, in fact, it is new. It is the second time it's been given out, named after Bruce Winstein, a dear friend of the department, a supporter of the department, and one of our most distinguished alumni. Uh, he graduated with a bachelor's degree in approximately 1965 and uh, did a lot of great work in particle physics. I remember first meeting him when I was a graduate student at University of Chicago, and I was always very much afraid of him. <laughs> uh, and since then, he went on to become a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, so this award is given for the uh, uh, most outstanding independent work in particle and nuclear physics. And uh, we're pleased this year to give it to Nicholas Frontier. So I first heard of Nick actually in hushed tones from the other undergraduates. He had quite, I don't believe he's here right now so we can talk about him. Um, <laughs> he actually did most of this work uh, at Argonne National Laboratory, not on campus, but on Argonne National Laboratory. And it turns out I'm actually not allowed to tell you mostly what it was about. But it did involve uh, production of gamma rays and x-rays from high, uh, high altitude events in, in the upper atmosphere. So he will also get a certificate and, and a nice check, um, presumably by some secret courier, because I'm probably not allowed to tell you where he is right now. So. Thank you, David. I'll risk uh, censure and uh, tell you that Nicholas is back at Argonne pursuing his uh, summer studies. He has <clears throat> an extremely high level of uh, commitment and this award kind of obviously went to him this year. So um, it is now my pleasure to uh, introduce our student speakers. First up, we'll, have, uh, we'll hear from uh, Chris Cooper, who is a PhD uh, uh, candidate who will be receiving his PhD evidently today. So uh, <laughs> I introduce to you Dr. Cooper. Hello, everybody. I wanted to say congratulations to the undergraduate physics and astronomy class of 2012. <clears throat> and congratulations to the graduate physics and astronomy class of 2009. Well, that, that was supposed to be my graduation years, which brings me to the topic of graduate school. <clears throat> For those of you who have never experienced graduate school, here's a quick summary. Any undergrads going on to graduate school, please cover your ears. So the first years are the most difficult classes of your life, graduate level physics. This culminates in a comprehensive exam where you have to calculate the muzzle velocity required to shoot a turkey and have it land on a plate 100 kilometers away, cooked entirely by air resistance. And as any of us new PhDs can tell you, oh, it's trivial, just use the Lagrangian. <laughs> See, we already sound like professors. A common joke is that the morning of your comprehensive exam, you are the smartest physicist you will ever be. And after this, you join a research group and develop a program for your PhD. You take an oral qualifying exam where you convince a committee that your work will be PhD worthy in a few years through the clever use of timelines. <laughs> Hundreds of papers, months of, of observing, and half a dozen vacuum leaks later, you defend your PhD. And now you can call yourself a doctor. But no, not in a hospital. No, they don't allow that, actually. <laughs> but apart from all the reading, writing, and research, graduate school wasn't all work. My years spent in graduate school were the best years of my life. And I have so many positive memories from graduate school at UCLA. 
We all bonded over a common experience, working on problem sets with our classmates, setting pi approximately equal to one for very small values of pi, <laughs> meeting other graduate students at the Weyburn Terrace parties, getting free food at the Thursday seminars, hanging out at the monthly physics social and the annual MPSC mixer, and living on a graduate student's salary in one of the most expensive cities on the planet. <laughs> also having Arnold Schwarzenegger sign your master's diploma. That was kind of neat. But it was through this bonding that I met my best friends in graduate school. The bonds we forged with each other in grad school have implications beyond mere camaraderie. Although we all shared a common love of the hard sciences, we came from a diverse background in even different countries. Some of us were born the children of scientists with PhDs already, but for many of us, we're the first in our families to receive any degrees, let alone a PhD. And this demonstrates a very important point, that regardless of our background, income, gender, culture, or ethnicity, we all accomplished our goal of receiving a PhD and became the smartest people on the planet, the intellectual 1%. And this is, this is often taken for granted in our generation, but I can assure you that the graduating class of 1912 or 1962 had a much different makeup than that of 2012. And this is because of the people who helped us along the way. Even though we worked hard to get a PhD, there are many people working behind the scenes helping us, literally from day one. Our parents, teachers, advisors, mentors, friends, and family all deserve a huge amount of thanks to today. UCLA is an amazing school to study at. The professors and staff here are incredibly nice and helpful. And we could not have accomplished our goals without you. So thank you, everybody. And thank you, Mom and Dad, and Dr. Gackelman, if he's here, and Dr. Meshkat. <clears throat> so like citations in your thesis, be generous with the number of people you give credit to for helping you today. For most, of us, <laughs> for most of us, getting a PhD was the most difficult task we have ever accomplished. And this was more than just two to four years of graduate school followed by an automatic degree, unlike some other professional degrees. And physics and astronomy are obviously the hardest topics to study. It is often said that with a physics or an astronomy degree, you can do anything. It requires a significant level of critical thinking and a nearly cynical level of skepticism. Perfect for any job. <laughs> and everyone graduating in this audience today has learned an enormous amount of real world skills that will help you in any of your future careers. Some of us are continuing in research and some of us are starting jobs in the business world. But all of us completed the most mentally challenging feat the human race has ever come up with. So remember that you will have the title of doctor for the rest of your life. And sometimes you might be the smartest person in the room, and that's kind of awesome. But your kids will be the kids with the smart parents. But you will also have high expectations placed on you for the rest of your life. And you will continue to exceed those expectations. Whether or not you realize it, you will be role models for the rest of your life. And you carry the responsibility to lead by example, educate the masses, and change the world. So as you move forward with your lives, remember to look fondly back on your time at UCLA. Before graduate school, my knowledge of Los Angeles was limited to movies like LA Confidential, Chinatown, and Crash. <laughs> and now after <laughs> seven years in graduate school, <laughs> I know the real LA. I only shop at farmer's markets, I dine among celebrities, and I drive no faster than 20 miles per hour on the freeways. <laughs> I even took a week and ordered everything on the secret menu at In-N-Out, just to do it. But where else can you ski all morning and be on the beach in the afternoon? We are so lucky to have spent our 20s in Los Angeles, the most pretentious and hedonistic cultural capital of the world. <laughs> but I'm very excited and optimistic about all of our futures. Many of us are leaving California to move on to bigger and better things. For those of you who have never left California or blocked out a childhood spent in snowstorms in upstate New York, like me, here's some advice on how things work in the rest of the country. First off, 
No one wants to hear about how awesome the weather was in SoCal every single day, <laughs> or, or how it's hard for you to wear closed-toed sho closed shoes in the machine shop because you wore sandals to work every day. Also, the rest of the country does not have access to cupcake ATMs. <laughs> Finally, regular work days start at 8 a.m., not at 10.30 like in graduate school. And as Jack Donaghy and Liz Lemon once famously said on 30 Rock, we might not be the best people, but we're not the worst people. Graduate students are the worst. And now you are no longer graduate students. You are doctors, capable of inspiring others to greatness and correcting Professor Salzberg's errors on the whiteboards in the Big Bang Theory. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. You lived up to expectation. <laughs> uh, next, we'll move on to another practitioner of the uh, secret arts of plasma physics, the uh, outstanding undergraduate who will give uh, the student address on behalf of the bachelor's uh, recipients today. Uh, please welcome Jacob Schwartz. I thought I was nervous for giving this speech, but then Chris's description of grad school. <laughs> All right. so, yeah. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. Physicists like to model systems as simply as possible. For example, cows are spheres. Humans are cylinders. Well, today we become graduated cylinders. These years seem to have gone by like a neutrino moving faster than the speed of light. <laughs> Yesterday, we were bright and eager freshmen who had never even heard of that Alfred Einstein guy and who barely knew Newton's laws. Today, we're graduating, and most of us still barely know Newton's laws. <laughs> but that's okay, because I'm sure it's up in here somewhere just in case we need to you know, know it again in the future. In these years of physics, we've done a lot of work. In operative physics alone, I calculate that we've done somewhere around 100 problem sets and typed up about 30 lab reports of increasing thickness. And in our classes, we've learned some amazing things. In electricity and magnetism, we've learned about the forces behind everything from iPhones to molecules. In, in mechanics, we studied relativity and learned the real meaning behind E equals mc squared. And then in quantum mechanics, we learned that everything we thought we knew was wrong and that the universe is truly a stranger place than we imagined. In our lab class, we've done some really cool experiments too. For example, in 18L, the modern physics lab, which has three tabletop experiments, <laughs> we, which has three tabletop experiments, we measured three of the fundamental constants of nature, the mass and charge of the electron and Planck's constant, at least to within, uh, at least to within a factor of 10 or so. Oh, speaking of 18L, uh, now that we're all graduated and the can't touch the water in the inverted fountain or you have to stay an extra quarter curse is broken, if anyone wants to come with me afterward to measure the actual inner diameter of the drain. Um, I... No, no, but seriously, though, yeah. We, we, we got to find out what it is. All right. So. Even after these thousands of hours of practice, sometimes I feel like I still know nothing. Physics, astrophysics, and biophysics are all such wide-ranging fields that four years is barely enough time to give us the very basics. What we have learned is merely the foundation to be built upon later in our careers, in graduate school, or in individual study. And sometimes we felt bogged down by all this work, like we were caught in a trap, a particle of mass m in an infinite square well but sometimes we look up from our problem sets and lab reports and observe the world. 
Physics is a set of tools to understand how the universe works. And learning physics does change the way you see things. When you look at a rainbow, or the full moon, or a distant star, or a living organism, when you stand on the shore and watch the waves roll in, or see snowflakes swirling in the wind, physics is there with you. <laughs> and knowing the science behind what you see doesn't subtract from the beauty, it only adds. Here at UCLA, we try to make our physics fun. We hang out in physics clubhouse and eat pizza and do problem sets together, getting help from our graduate student TAs. Some of us come to the weekly meetings of Society of Physics Students and or Undergraduate Astronomical Society, uh, at least to stay long enough for the free pizza. Some of my favorite memories have been with these groups, building bridges and towers of spaghetti and marshmallows, watching cheesy sci-fi films, or giving a lecture on how to destroy the Earth. Or like that one end of the quarter barbecue when the fire department showed up and asked where the fire was. <laughs> or like that one time when we got a blurb about 14 physics majors in the Daily Bruin in the Crime Watch section. <laughs> of course, we don't just study physics. Some of us are salsa dancers. Some of us who requested to, to remain nameless, like Brian Springer, are headed off to law school. At least one of us already works for that world's coolest private space, life, space flight from SpaceX. Whatever we end up doing when we leave, even if we forget all four of Maxwell's equations, I know that we'll consider all of our sweat and all-nighters here at UCLA as still worth it. We've learned a bit about how the world works, met some cool people, and made some friends. Having been through this, we're all stronger for it. And at the very least, we've learned humility. We recognize that, it wouldn't, that we wouldn't be here if it weren't for all of you. So thank you, parents and, relative, excuse me, parents and relatives who's, who've supported us every step of the way and who've, thou, who've flown thousands of miles to be with us here on this day. Thank you, counselors, Francoise and Elaine, who got us into those classes even when they were technically full. <laughs> thank you, professors, who were teachers and mentors in classes and in lab, and who, in office hours, went over that thing one more time again, real slow. <laughs> thank, you, grad thank you, grad students, for being super cool physics mentors. And especially thank you, grad students, who, when we had no idea how to start, used our, homework, or used our discussion sections to do our homework problems. <laughs> and finally, thank you, fellow graduates, for all the times we shared. It's been great. Thank you, Jacob. Well, <clears throat> I'm not sure if uh, our graduates who spoke uh, today are happy just because it was a great experience here or they're happy because it's over, but uh, <laughs> you can ask. Um, the unspoken model that uh, one has in academia, particularly strongly in physics and astronomy, is to replicate yourself as a faculty member in the students, and particularly uh, at the level of the PhD. Um, we're not necessarily so adept at explaining the other paths that are available in life, and they are considerable, as uh, our students have already uh, alluded to. Um, so what we will do at this point is, uh, is we will ask one of our uh, esteemed and accomplished uh, graduates, Howard Preston, uh, to help illuminate some of these issues. Um, let me give you Howard's bio, since uh, he will be too modest uh, to, to do so. Let's uh, uh, begin at the, be at the beginning. Uh, Howard was born in New Jersey in 1943 and attended uh, UCLA. Um, as both undergraduate and graduate, receiving his PhD in theoretical physics in 1974. When he was an undergraduate, he designed and built instruments for the nuclear physics group, and uh, these, uh, this activity set the stage for the endeavors that uh, followed. In 1980, he began Preston Cinema Systems with its first product, the Micro Force Zoom Control. In 1985, he was awarded a tech Technical Achievement Award from the Motion Picture uh, Academy for the Speed Aperture Computer. 
He designed the snorkel lens used to photograph Blade Runner and Star Trek. Subsequently, he's led the design team responsible for a number of groundbreaking projects, including the Light Ranger laser autofocus system and the mm, F, uh, I plus Z wireless con uh, control system. This system received the Scientific and Engineering Award from the Motion Picture Academy in 2007. Uh, Preston Cinema Systems since then has become the leading supplier of wireless controls in North America and has a strong global presence with representation in the major cinema markets throughout the world. Howard is the president of uh, this uh, entity, uh, Preston Cinema Systems. He's the holder of four U.S. patents and a member of the American Physical Society, the Optical Society of America, and the American Society of Cinematographers. He received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Society of Camera Operators in 2007 and the Lifetime Achievement Award from Cinegear in 2010. These are Howard's accomplishments on uh, paper um, and uh, they, they say a lot about who, who he is and what he's accomplished since uh, leaving UCLA. Uh, one of the things we should also tell to you is that he is uh, uh, an extremely active supporter of the department. Uh, in particular, uh, he and his wife are very active in supporting uh, the astronomy uh, uh, research program here. Um, so it is really with uh, uh, pleasure and with uh, a sense of honor that we invite now Howard Preston to the podium. Uh, Dean Rudnick, Chair Rosenzweig, faculty, parents, and members of the graduating class of 2012. Today is a special day for many of you. It is the fulfillment of long-held dreams and hard-fought accomplishments. Studying astronomy and physics, you have taken, in the words of Robert Frost, the road less traveled. Electrodynamics, quantum mechanics, astrophysical dynamics, these are challenges that few students willingly engage, much less embrace. Today we're here to celebrate your achievements and talk a bit about tomorrow. As you all know, by now, your paths will be straight and predictable. <laughs> Until you leave this hall and dive into that river called life. T.S. Eliot said, if you aren't in over your head, how do you know how tall you are? So be prepared to get wet. I'm here to tell you some stories about what happened to me after I dove into that river 46 years ago. I hope by recounting some of the incidents which guided my career, I can illuminate the interplay between opportunity, risk, passion, and reward, and in the end, give you some useful advice. I'll begin my story in 1965. That was the year when the discovery of the 2.7 degree microwave background, the residue of the Big Bang was published. I learned about it 10 years later, the year after I received my PhD, while reading the book, Intelligent Life in the Universe by Russian astronomers Josef Shklovsky and Carl Sagan. I thought the discovery of the cosmic microwave background was one of the most amazing and astonishing things I had ever read. The notion that we are and have been surrounded by this invisible fog of microwave radiation, the evidence of the birth of the universe, was absolutely startling. Also in 1975, Jacob Bernowski's Ascent of Man was broadcast here in the U.S. Bernowski was, among other things, a mathematician, a biologist, and an author. In the Ascent of Man, he showed using art, architecture, music, literature, all the manifestations of culture, how human society evolved through its understanding of the world through science. For me, physics and astronomy have always had an intrinsic beauty and elegance, and Bernowski's film was an epiphany. In a moment of complete and utter irrationality and naivety, the die was cast. I would leap into unknown waters. I would make a film, a documentary film about cosmology, and called it The Universe, Man's Changing Perceptions. 
With hardly enough money to process film, this was clearly going to be a very minimalist piece. But armed with boundless optimism, negligible skill, and a newfound passion, and a 16 millimeter camera borrowed from my wife's brother-in-law, a great stroke of luck if there ever was one, I began the journey. One I thought would complete in maybe six months. Writing, filming, editing, music, sound, narration, all these things had to be learned. I was thrilled with the challenges. The six months stretched out, one year, then two. The scraps of films uh, were finally assembled into a final form, and I submitted it to film, uh, three film festivals and won three medals. Apparently, film festival juries weren't being besieged with legions of filmmakers anxious to tell the story of the cosmic microwave background. <laughs> Buoyed by success, I started a small business, one employee, me, selling copies of the film to schools and libraries. After a year or two, the film turned to small profit. I had survived business 101, but I was obviously still a rank beginner and had no clear idea of what to do next. Then the phone rang. Opportunity was on the line. In 1977, Star Wars had just been released and the producer of The Invasion of the Body Snatchers thought that adding a space sequence to his film might add to its box office. Since the production budget had already been spent, the call went out to find somebody to shoot the sequence really cheap. <laughs> of course, no one knew what the sequence should look like, something like space and creatures, pods flying off into some alien planet. Use your imagination. We'll know it when we see it. After the usual suspects turned it down, and the friends of the usual suspects did the same, I was left. Director Phil Coffin had gotten his law degree from Harvard before beginning a distinguished career in both writing and directing. He was certainly no stranger to taking risks. He looked at some tests I shot, gave me the job, and I suspect kept his fingers crossed. A few months later, I found myself sitting on the floor of a single engine Cessna, straddling a camera, peering down through a hole cut into the floor of the aircraft, looking at a solid blanket of clouds. The space aliens' long fall through the clouds and onto the Earth below was to be captured by a long zoom, beginning imperceptibly and then smoothly accelerating until the end. I watched as the sun began to burn through the clouds, revealing the San Francisco skyline. We had made it. As I started shooting, my feeling of relief was soon uh, cut short. The state-of-the-art zoom control I was holding in my hand was once again proving its reputation for bulkiness. Rather than a smooth and imperceptible zoom, the zoom was jumpy and unpredictable. I kept shooting takes until I had gone through the thousand feet of film in the magazine. The clouds had burned off and there was nothing left to do except to return to the airport in San Jose and hope for the best. I knew that the zoom control was a ridiculous disaster and that I could do better. So I vowed to make a better control whenever I had some time. This time I was lucky. There were enough good takes to complete the opening sequence, and much to my amazement, the sequence made it to the first round of selections for the 1979 Academy Awards Special Effects category. That year, Superman, with an effects budget a few hundred times greater than mine, very deservedly flew away with the Academy Award. <laughs> After the Body Snatchers film, I got a call from Woody Allen's production designer, Mel Bourne. Woody was working on a new project and needed some effects work. Might I be interested? Duh, tough decision. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the film was Manhattan, and the work consisted of filming a background of Saturn and its rings, standing in for a Hayden Planetarium diorama, and a star field to stand in for the city's night sky. I shot the footage of the star field and sent the print overnight to New York. Mel calls. Uh, I'm gonna be in, in LA tomorrow. Mind if I drop in? This is never good news. The morning comes and Mel is standing in the studio in Hollywood. Woody doesn't like your night sky. Oh, what's wrong with it? 
I tried to make it really accurate. I showed him my sky map. Mel, uh, you don't understand. Woody's never seen the night sky. <laughs> He's from New York. <laughs> Me, Gad, what are we supposed to do? Mel walks over to the four by eight star field, takes up a sharpened awl and says, may I? Doesn't wait very long before he starts pecking out new constellations like a cosmic woodpecker. Don't feel bad, he continued as he added more stars by the second. Every Friday, I drive up to the set with a truck full of furniture that I spent all week collecting. I open the gate, Woody looks in, shakes his head and off I go again, more furniture. I stood back from the star field. The delicate veil of the Milky Way had been transformed into a cloud of fireflies the size of Buicks. <laughs> Masterpiece, declared Mel. Now that's a sky. <laughs> of course, Manhattan was and remains a delicious treat. Hypocrisy, lust, deception, and love. The human condition is seen through the eyes of one of film's greatest and funniest directors. For me, it was a wonderful privilege to add a bit of starlight to Woody's piece. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, all life is an experiment. The more experiments, the better. It was time for another experiment. An astronomer friend from grad school, Don Goldsmith, informed me that Carl Sagan, who had been his undergraduate advisor at Harvard, needed an effect sequence shot for his PBS series, Cosmos. Perhaps I was interested. Carl wanted to demonstrate on film how the view of your surroundings would appear if you were traveling near the speed of light. For this sequence, I was to film the point of view of a boy riding a scooter in Vinci, Italy, Leonardo's hometown. There, at Carl's request, the speed of light was reduced from 186 miles a second to 25 miles an hour. Since computer graphic effects were a decade away, most of this transformation would have to be done in the camera using electronics and optics, all of which I would have to design. This was amazing luck. Not only would I get to work with Sagan, whose book had been partly responsible for setting me off on this path, but I would be able to use some of my science background to do a little inventing. In order to simulate the scooter changing speed rapidly, I made a device to instead change the speed of the camera and simultaneously compensate the lens iris to maintain constant exposure. To simulate the optical aberrations of special relativity using the very limited resources available, I constructed a special zoom lens. At its longest focal length, its view of the world looked normal. At its shortest focal length, the world appeared compressed and distorted into a small circle like the fisheye view through a door peephole. The zoom lens and camera speed were electronically linked, so the apparent speed of the scooter and the view through the lens changed at the same time. Not to be forgotten, the Doppler shift would be added later, blue shifting the central part of the image, which showed objects in the direction of motion, and red shifting the receding imagery, captured along the circumference of the fisheye image. I met Carl and the Cosmos crew in the plaza of the small hilltop town of Vinci sitting on a plywood, plywood platform bolted to the front of an aging cargo truck. Carl looked through the lens, nodded his approval, and off we went in a cloud of diesel. The truck wheezed its way up and down the Tuscan hills, honking its horn and ignoring the occasional stop signs. Italy was still a country of miracles. Not only had we not struck any of the goats which wandered the roads, but everything worked. Cosmos went on to become the most widely watched PBS series in the world. While shooting effect sequences had been a lot of fun, I wasn't certain that I wanted to build a business to continue doing effects work. The success of Star Wars led to an enormous demand for film effects, mostly centered around motion control animation. Large industrial scale effects studios were already springing up in vacated aircraft assembly buildings around Los Angeles. But I had little interest in joining what I saw was a largely mechanical enterprise. I felt a special satisfaction in having imagined and constructed the devices for the Cosmos project. And I began to consider the possibility 
of making commercial products based on some of the devices I had developed. Having some time on my hands and remembering the vow I made after shooting the invasion of the body snatchers, I designed a zoom control based on an impressively stable force sensor used in military aircraft and called it the Microforce. Prototype in hand, I conducted my first product demo. An hour later, I was in the technology business. I exhibited the Microforce in trade shows in LA and New York, knocked on doors, placed ads in trade magazines, and in a few years, the Microforce became an industry standard piece of equipment. Although I had never intended to run a business, I also realized it would be foolish not to take advantage of the opportunity that was squarely in front of me. And so I set about addressing some of the many other issues confronting the cinema industry. Out of the Cosmos sequence came the speed aperture computer, the device which controlled the camera and lens for the Cosmos sequence. It was subsequently given a technical achievement award by the Motion Picture Academy. Following that, a steady stream of new products, control systems for cameras and lenses, a gyro-stabilized camera system for helicopters, and the Light Ranger, the world's first autofocus system based on laser ranging. I had finally found an arena where I could indulge both my creative instinct and technical skills. My timing was also serendipitous. The control systems I was busy designing were soon to fill a critical need, remotely controlling the Steadicam. With the invention of the Steadicam in 1976, cameras became mobile, bringing the audience into the midst of the action. But now the cameras could no longer be tethered to controls through cables. They needed to be able to move about freely on the set. They needed to be controlled through a wireless link. The wireless controls in use at that time used simple modules made for model airplanes and cars. They were cheap, readily available, frequently malfunctioned, and were beset with interference problems. Many a film set was paralyzed while a neighborhood was searched for a rogue model car, an airplane, or an even an aberrant garage door opener. In 1995, 1994, we showed our first digital but non-wireless control system for cameras and lenses at the LA Convention Center, mostly to yawns. It looked like it was gonna be a very slow show. I felt a tap on my shoulder and looked up. There, peering down at me, was cinematographer Mark O'Kane, one of Hollywood's muscular Steadicam gladiators. He explained that he had just been hired for the upcoming Waterworld film. He was to film from the pontoons of actor Kevin Costner's Trimaran, wearing 80 pounds of Steadicam and camera gear as the boat sliced through the waters off the Hawaiian coast. The camera was to be focused by his assistant, riding in an adjacent boat, bobbing in the waves. Waterworld was uh, slated to be the most expensive film ever made. Equipment failure would not be looked upon kindly. Mark slapped our shiny new wireless, non-wireless control in his hand. What's the price for a wireless version, he asked. We don't have a wireless version. Can you make me one? Well, it's possible. His heavy hand fell on my shoulder. I'll call you Monday. I didn't have to wait for his call. I decided to make the leap. Our first wireless camera and lens control made it to the Waterworld set, worked nonstop, and made its reputation. Today, our wireless controls are used on sets throughout the world. In recognition of this, the Motion Picture Academy awarded a Scientific and Technical Engineering Award for our work in 2007. Well, that's enough about me. What about you? Your studies in physics, math, and astronomy have prepared you to tackle difficult problems both inside and outside your disciplines. Your studies outside your majors in the arts and humanities open up a vast new, vast new possibilities of engagement. Today, physicists and astronomers are solving problems in cancer research, energy, economics, entertainment, artificial intelligence, 
climate studies, transportation, public policy, well, the list is endless. Did I mention Wall Street? Bank melt meltdowns, credit default swaps, too big to fail. Maybe some of you out there can tackle a few of those problems too. I'd be really grateful. <laughs> Here are three suggestions. Explore the world, knock on doors, take interviews, learn its problems, seek out those that engage your passions. Two, take risks. You have to, you have no other choice. You're young, you're bright, and you will learn. Number three, don't be afraid to fail. It's certainly not fun, but it's how you will grow. On occasions like this, two words are often quoted. Carpe diem, seize the day. The words are those of Horace, the Roman poet of 23 BC. However, his full meaning is revealed when you read the rest of the line, which re reads, quam minimum credula postero, which translates as trusting as little as possible in the future. I must take issue with Horace. I'm here because I had faith in the future, and you are here because you are the future. As you set off for the next leg of your journey, I wish you great happiness, luck, joy, satisfaction in all you partake, great passion with which to guide your way, and the courage to stay the course. Thank you.